you don't want to be a translator, you just don't apply to be a translator. Well, it's not done, Norman. That's not what I was trying to remember. Well, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> How is everyone? Great. Stick to me. We oh, before we begin, um, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, because it didn't work in first years on Thursday. Can you? If you, I think most of you probably on Canvas, right? At the moment, can you go into your dashboard and have a look to see if the surveys are up? I still can't get online. I'm still fine. You're still waiting here. Yeah, sorry. No problem. And if so, please do the mid module. I you, the way they set yours up, the tiles, is so different to mine. Um, it's usually at the bottom, I think. Oh, while we're talking about Canvas, can you put me on a student again, now that I'm on the module? Because I think I've still got my oh. special view in it. Uh, you've been, yeah, you have swapped onto it. Yeah, you? yeah, yeah I've done that automatically. On, no, it didn't, so I've still oh, got like, all the extra <laughs> medleys. I just come out of it, but it just needs a lot of extra time. Yeah, yeah, you can see I'm walking around like <laughs> <laughs> so now as well. Um, I don't know if I can do it off my phone. No, that's alright, okay. it doesn't need to be immediately. Just, I thought I'd remember to tell you. I got, I, I've got to remember who's to email about that shit. I can always send an email to the module peeps if, if you want. No, no, it's fine. I'll, I'll sort it later. Yeah, no problem. Um, oh, you are down as a student as well. <laughs> yeah, I've had the confirmation all through. Oh, so what? You're here in this boat. So when I go back to the office, I'll just move. Yeah, great. Thank you. If I can. Cool. Moving people, I think, is less straightforward than it looks. Is this working? Is this modules? Mm -hmm. um, Does not work? Um, I think they close on Friday, so Next I'm going to have another module this year where I've got no feedback whatsoever. I might, I might send an email in a week just to remind people, can you take a minute to do it? It's no big deal. But uh, yeah, we have this problem on Tuesday, but I don't think they've done it right. It's just not working. Fuck do I care? Um, so, lecture four. Social constructionism, stereotypes, and representation of gamers themselves. Kind of important. Um, can anyone tell me where this image comes from? So far. It does. Excellent. Does anyone know what episode? Oh, big Love, Not Warcraft. Yeah. It does indeed. <laughs> Synopsis. They play World of Warcraft. And. <laughs> <laughs> and get the legendary sword and kill the troll. They do. So this guy is like the guy who, I think the World of War, they have like World of Warcraft um, engineers in what some part of the episode and they're like, you know, this guy has bucked everything in the game because he literally has no life. And it's this fat bastard who like literally all he does is play World of Warcraft all day. How do the boys get to the point of being able to beat him? They just grind it out. They grind it out, first of all. Do you remember how they physically transform? Alright, so there's a great montage in it of them grinding out enough XP to beat this guy. And in the process of doing they all put on about four stone of weight. All grew huge amounts of acne. Cartman basically becomes glued to a chair, which means he has to have like a bucket underneath him at all times um, to expunge waste which in typical South Park style is done really graphically. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that episode was made in 2008. So we're talking about a 14 year old television episode, which one shows that my references are really old. And two says that the image or a problematic image of gamers has existed for a very long time. Over the past 15 years, the image of the gamer has transformed somewhat from this sad pallor into something, I think, a bit more disturbing. 
Um, certainly since, I'd say, 2014, the image of the gamer has transformed into something wholly more disturbing. But I begin, as always, because one must, with a question. Given that everyone in this room plays games, right? Or you won't be doing this much, you'll uh, Eve. Um, <laughs> what is a gamer? It's not you play video games. It's not a simple thing. Okay. Someone who plays video games. Or highly involves himself with anyone. Oh, oh we've added contours now, Ben. Highly involves themselves in. What what does that mean? Highly in, to highly involve <coughs> oneself in something. How is that materialised? How is that exemplified in behaviour, in the context of wider society? It becomes part of your identity. Almost oh. like it's part of your personality, let's say. What are the markers for that? A certain dedication of time to it. Mm -hmm. And prioritisation. How much? How much gamer girl? Oh, is there a figure? <laughs> um, I mean, people have tried to quantify this in terms of amount of time spent. Do we feel that's a factor? There's some of us in here who are more committed than others, I would argue. Does that make you more of a gamer than someone else? Do we, are we comfortable with making that distinction? Let's go back a step. How do you tell if someone's a gamer without knowing? They've invested. So have they got a console? Have they got equipment? Okay. So there, there, there's, a, there's a material <coughs> aspect to it. You, you own equipment of some mm. kind. Clothing, references, <coughs> constantly comparing things to that. Let's have clothing. What do gamers dress like? Comfy. Comfy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hoodies and tracksuit bottoms are your friend, right? Um, okay, so there's. Is there a dress code? This is something that people are really, you've got the look on people's faces now, like they're straining to pass a clue in the air or something. It's like, yeah, I want to say it, but like... Um, kind of Jordan in particular, she's really straining to lay in here, but she's not going to do it, because she's far too nice to actually put the in. Um, <laughs> what about in terms of how the person is as an individual? Is there any defining characteristics of being a gamer? They're also nice. I think there used to be a stereotype, but in reality I don't think there is. What's the stereotype? Like? So the stereotype would be somebody who's like, almost like a classic nerd, I guess. Like maybe quiet, not socially outgoing, someone who's like really committed to one thing, probably quite smart. But I think actually in reality, from the gamers I know, they you know, you couldn't pinpoint them all into one category. I don't know, mind you describing Cheska to a T. <laughs> 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 <It's not nice. laughs> um, does that do those things hold true? Would be my point. Is that a reasonable set of characteristics? that we use as a If somebody says, oh, I'm a gamer, the, the, the very term itself acts as uh, what we call a heuristic, uh, a mental shortcut. And we have heuristics for all sorts of things in life. You know, we have schemata, uh, to use the psychological term, where you unpack a series of characteristics based on a singular characteristic. So for example, Eve is from the wrong one, right? Now that's a heuristic that means, you know, <coughs> nail down everything because, you know, it's bad news. Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we have these for lots of things, and you know, virtually everything, in fact. I got costed on Saturday night, right? In the 
wig and pen. Because <laughs> I hate drinking only the classiest places. <laughs> and um, I was on a stag do from 12 o'clock in the afternoon. This was about 7 o'clock. I was a bit worse for wear. And um, somebody came up to me and said, are you Leighton? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my friend's in your lectures. She thinks you're awesome. I was like, oh, that's nice. How am I supposed to react to this now? And, he said, and then the next thing was, I didn't think a lecturer would be drinking in here. I think it's a bit odd. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> but, okay, so there's a heuristic of play, right? University lecturer doesn't drink in stinking pit. This one, as Cheska only too, knows too well, drinks in just about every stinking pit in Swansea, right? So, there's that heuristic is at play. And, it, and when you come, when it clashes, it's a surprise. Do we have a heuristic construction of gamer? Josh says, I'm a gamer. What instantly clicks with regards to, we backfill the story. And it almost sounds like this is an awful stereotypical thing to do, but we do it all the time. This is how we negotiate social life in, in essence. You know, you, you need these mental shortcuts in order to make decisions on an everyday basis with regards to your social life. So when somebody says gamer, what do we backfill with? And there's no right answer here. I'm more interested in your impressions than anything. Or are you all just non-judgmental people? I think there's a lot of specifics to come into it. I think that, like, if you were, uh, I don't know, if you were to play some, uh, to enjoy games like, I don't know, like, Animal Crossing, Stardew Valley type thing, it's, it, it's a lot more wholesome of an idea than somebody who, who says that they might play, like, Counter-Strike or Siege or competitive super shooters, in which case I'm going to default and think that they're absolutely degenerates. That's interesting. That's interesting because what you've differentiated is type of gamer based on gameplay. It does that sound valid? You know, different gamers play different games. Yeah. Okay. That sounds perfectly reasonable to me. But you know, the t the type of game you play, the generic conventions of the game you play, and indeed, if you go back to um, what I was talking about last week with regards to procedural rhetoric, the idea that games convince you in different ways, thanks to the mechanics of the game. If being a gamer is a construction, then the type of games that you play will be part of that construction themselves. So, as you said, like, you know, people who play, I don't want to say, like, cute games, although that's probably generically what a lot of people would call these things, may have a different kind of construction of being a gamer than somebody who plays competitive shooters or League of Legends or something like that. Yeah. Um, in which case, the word gamer is problematic because gamer implies singular, that there is a singular construction of what a gamer is. Once you start to peel back type of game played, methods of playing, platforms you play on, mode of playing, whether you're social or individual, I, these things sort of fall apart, as far as I can see, rather quickly. So my initial point here is there is no such thing. The word gamer doesn't actually mean anything. It probably, the best way of thinking about it is exactly what Ben said, somebody who plays games. But it's too broad in order to be, have any kind of um, descriptive or analytic value because of that. But the word carries a lot of weight and does a lot of work in society. You know? we, we, we see the word a lot. There is gamer culture. But if gamer culture isn't based on a single thing, what is that culture? Well, it's a construct. It's artificial. It doesn't actually exist. It is something which is created, like most cultural moves, in order to make money off people. You know, you market, I mean, Jess, you mentioned, you know, um, <clears throat> right at the beginning, people would, you know, perhaps buy things and, you know, have markers of being a gamer. Things are marketed to people to indicate you're a gamer. Has anyone seen the TV show Dead Pixels? No? 
I recommend you all watch it. Um, in terms of, it's it's free. It's on um, all four. It's a, it's pretty funny. It's about three people who play uh, obsessively play a um, MM. M O R P G called Kingdom Hearts, I think it's called. Um, the female character is absolutely brilliant. And in one of the episodes, right at the cold open of the episode, she goes up to a girl at a bus stop who's got like a Pac-Man t-shirt on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can see the irony of that this morning. Um, and a few other sort of trinkets around her which are there to indicate gamer and she just absolutely eviscerates this girl and I think the whole thing is like did you ever shit in a bucket? Because I played Kingdom Hearts for like 14 hours straight and that's what I had to do to get it done. I'll put the work in, you wear the clothes bitch and then just walks off and leaves this woman crying in the street and it's just like yeah. That's a certain aspect of gamer culture which um, is being indicated there. And they kind of get obsessive gaming really accurate in that. So, initial point. What is a gamer? Too difficult a question to answer. It, it, questions that you can't answer properly aren't questions at all. There's something formally wrong with the question that you're asking. Gamer is a kind of a meaningless concept. Because in this room, we are all gamers, and yet we're all very different to one another. But we all fit into that broad category. So it's, as a category, it doesn't differentiate enough for, it to, for us to be useful. So what I want to do today is do a couple of things which I hope will help with assignment one. Where, first of all, I'm going to break down some of the categorizations that the industry itself makes about gamers, which is important. The gaming industry has an audience, if you like, just like any media does, and it makes assumptions. Gaming as an industry makes assumptions about who we are. So we can buck those assumptions, but we are always being pictured in a particular way. And because of that, the games that we receive and play are made for a particular type of person. Overwhelmingly, in particular, if you um, if you look at the top end of the market, what we call triple A games, you know, big budget stuff, hundreds of millions in terms of development and marketing, those games are exclusively made for a particular demographic. The gaming companies make a very direct assumption about what a gamer is. That is deeply problematic because it perpetuates particular cultural stereotypes about gamers and also perpetuates a particular culture. There's a cultural aspect then to, you know, the games that we have produce, so we're saying you know, different games produce different people. If the big games, the ones that actually make the money, because only 20% of video games actually make any money at all, and those 20% support the rest of the entire industry effectively, those games actually create a particularly problematic cultural aspect because they are made in a particular way for a particular set of people. People who, not too fine a point on it, if we're looking around this room, it's Josh, it's Ben, it's Mason, it's me. <laughs> it's Jack. <laughs> it's for us. It's Dawson. Right? We are who they're making games for. Um, we, may not, we may not like that, but this is how it is. So I'll have a look at that. Then we'll look at um, the intersection between gaming itself as an activity and production. How games and the production of games, inter gamers and production of games intermix. In particular with some focus about how gaming has actually changed from being an audience activity to a production activity. And that I think is something which you'll all at least resonate with because I'm asking you to do the same thing effectively for some too. So, Within this, what I really want, most of the content for this lecture is taken from Jamie Madigan's book, I should say first of all, which I've sat as reading as well, so if you've read it already, some of this will look very familiar to you. The reason why I think Jamie Madigan's book is really useful for this topic is he's, uh, he's a very interesting psychologist first of all, in that he's quite critical about psychology and the assumptions it makes, and two, he, he, really dives into 
this differentiation of gamers. Um, he's willing to pull apart the idea of what a gamer is in a really effective way that I haven't seen other people do very effectively. So I think Jamie Madigan is really good on this. Um, Madigan's first point, and one of the most important ones, is trying to drill down into what the difference between a casual gamer and a hardcore gamer is. And it's something you started on, Jess. Is there anyone in this room who considers themselves a hardcore gamer? You liar. Absolute liar. Define hardcore though, like... Why don't you define it? Oh, but like, like when, when we're doing like Overwatch, because we're like... Quiet. Just the Quiet. word Overwatch first of all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's not fun anymore though. We play it because we It was never like... fun. But you yeah, played it anyway. <laughs> but it's not like playing a game though, it's like we're doing like a job. Like we take it so seriously, it's so stupid, but we do it because I I, th I think there's some key indicators of what a hardcore gamer is right there, you know? Taking it extremely seriously as not necessarily a game itself, but some kind of function which is beyond game. You know, this isn't play. We go back to lecture two and you know definitions and theories of play. This is beyond play, right? This is a this is a role. This is a, a part of life where you have to put in the hours. Why? So you get bullied and it works out and you win. Happy. Dopamine hit. Oh yeah, that's it. Okay, so hardcore <laughs> games. There's commitment of time. There's commitment of energy. There's, I think one of the key ways of, the commitment of time indicates always that there's a segmentation of activity. That as a you know, if somebody, or if we want to consider somebody a hardcore gamer, there's somebody who dedicates elements of their time to gaming itself. You, 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 you plan, right? You kind of schedule to do this stuff. Not so much me. It's, I've got to say that at that point, I drop off the hardcore gaming thing. It is much more like, oh, I've got a couple of hours before it's nine o'clock and I can finally go to bed. Because you get to my age and you think, I really want to go to bed at seven. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but this gap in your life, you said, if you start going to bed at seven, I mean, you may as well move with old people so <coughs> this one, you know, you sad, but. So it's trying and stay up till nine, well, it's got this block from seven till nine, I'll put something on. That isn't, that's not hardcore in that sense. So, I think there is, um, if you want to call them serious gamers or hardcore gamers, there is a dedication to the activity with regards, you know, actually allocating time and resources within a week to do this. Organising very often with other people to do this. Um, a lot of, I think, ideas about you know, who's a serious gamer now invokes the idea of social play and being part of a community of players where you play with, you know, and, and not just play alongside others, but with specific others that you know that you have a either parasocial or social relationship facilitated by network technology with. So, you know, um, serious gamers there is probably the easiest one. Do you think he's on about with core gamers? It is a term that's used by gaming companies mostly. Maybe you talk about the kind of people they always know when they buy the product. Spot on. So, uh, a core gamer for a gaming company would be uh, New Modern Warfare comes out, they know you're going to get it. Yeah, you, you, you basically core audience um, in that sense. Casual gamer, then? I, I'm assuming most of us fall into this category. What, how, do we, how do we invoke the casual gamer? I'll play exactly one game in a different one for a little bit of time to spend. Maybe slight fascinations at points, maybe like a two week binge of Minecraft and then won't touch for a year and a half. 
sound resonant for people in terms of their experience of how you do things? It's pretty much it for me. I'm, I'm currently on Far Cry 6. Um, uh, 20% through? Will I finish it? I don't know. It, oh, what will probably happen is I'll get quite a long way into it in the next couple of weeks. Stop, pick up something else to play. A year from now, I'll go back to my save game and try and finish it and I'll have another two weeks of doing it and then I'll never think about it again. That kind of marks me as a casual gamer, I think. You know, Mobile gamer. Are people who play games on their phones only gamers? <laughs> Is Eve a gamer? <laughs> Is the question here. Candy Crush Saga people, are they actual gamers? Well, the industry says so. Hmm? The industry says so. The, every Go like on. every AAA game now has like at least like a companion app to. Of course it does, yeah. Yeah, it's they're absolutely targeted. Whether or not we want to consider them as. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any idea what the scale of the mobile gaming industry is in terms of revenue? Oh, it's hundreds of millions. And. <laughs> it's way more than that. Million, million. <laughs> it's, it's billions. It's, it's it's up there like Hollywood numbers, basically. It's huge. I think this differentiation is really problematic when you come to like people who spend hours and hours, and there are people who do this, <coughs> who spend hours and hours on a mobile game, like all the time. Back, what are we talking? Ten years ago, maybe eleven years ago. Angry Birds. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That, the company made Angry Birds went ballistic. I mean, they made billions overnight in that game. Every fucker was playing it. David Cameron, the Prime Minister, played that game, which kind of put me off and kind of resonated weirdly with that whole rumour that with the pig's head <laughs> as well. Um, it, kind of, it was a deep psychosexual thing going on with playing that game, which probably not the time to get into it at the moment. Um, these get, games come out of kind of nowhere on mobile and they become cultural touchstones as well. They made a film of Angry Birds, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there was an Angry Birds movie. Mm -hmm. I've not seen it and I've got no desire to see it either, but that shows you that there's a cultural tipping point for mobile games and the numbers of people and the revenue that those games actually generate is phenomenal. Unbelievable. If you get a hit as a mobile game, you're set. As well as Candy Crush turns over. It's been around for a hell of a long time. That game. And that game isn't even remotely original. There's been puzzle games like that going back to like the 1970s. But it's colourful, nice music, really interesting construction in terms of tapping into the part of the limbic system which is triggered by gambling. So it's got the same sort of physiological effects as you get if you put a bet on and win. Basically, it taps into exactly the same system. So it's actually engineered by not just game designers, but also in conjunction with physiologists and psychologists about how you time reward mechanisms within the game, how you keep people hooked and hooked. I had a serious addiction to Candy Crush Saga a few years ago. <clears throat> to the extent to which I would, nobody's going to watch this, are they? So the extent to which I would go to team meetings, and that's all I would do, right? So it's like blah 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 blah, blah, blah. Just all going in and out. It was just like I was not listening at all. I was going nuts. I got up to like level two thousand odd or something like that. And then I turned around one night. I was like, I've been playing this for like four hours tonight. I've got to delete this shit. There, there's, there is better things to do. I, I could have gone to the pub. You know, I could have got wasted. That would have been a better use of my time. So, mobile gamers, this is a category of people which often isn't considered, is the thing I, I would talk about, you know, here, that in terms of how we think about gamers, mobile gamers, not really something that we consider. Now, the industry considers this. The industry has an image of who a mobile gamer is. And guess what? That's who it looks like. 
<laughs> archetypal. If, if, the mobile, if the mobile game industry is thinking about who is our player, that's it. And you, you know, and you. But to an extent, that's how the game is pictured. Mobile gamers are pictured as primarily young, female, not engaged perhaps in gaming culture in the same way as me or someone else. Therefore, the games are constructed, and indeed the culture around mobile games is constructed in a particular fashion. And that's really, I think, what Jamie's trying to get at in this. So the casual versus serious sort of debate, I think, is really, really problematic because it relies on two type, on two very, very straightforward stereotypes. Men do serious games, women do casual games. <coughs> casual games, it, to an extent, would be big console games, which are big hits that everyone knows about. It would be games, perhaps, like Minecraft, would be a great example of what somebody would consider something which can bridge between serious and casual. You know, it's, it's something which has got a cultural resonance, which you know most people. Has anyone not played Minecraft in here? Really? Yeah. Why not? It's just never a rule. <laughs> I don't know. Never grabbed me. I've played it for like twenty minutes. Yeah. I'll be honest, I was about it, and it's like. I can't be fucked with this like this. <laughs> I can I can really see why people get into it, but it's just not my cup of tea. But um, women do casual games, men do serious games. This is the stereotype. The stereotype is not true. Like most stereotypes, it is perhaps based on an idea which makes sense from a particular perspective, but has far too little detail in order for it to hold true. So casual gaming is thought of as only needing a very sporadic attention up to a threshold of five minutes. So you pick something up, give it a go, throw it away. That's kind of the definition you use of casual gamers. You engage for a little bit. It's like Eve now, right? She'll keep on losing when she's going down to uh, going down with Dutch to the gang there, and you know she keeps on shooting the place up, and it's not good. She'll give up. <laughs> well, I've already done it a few times. There you are. Uh, casual gamer. Right? Five minute attention span. It's really interesting to me that the casual gamer five minute attention span generally applies to the gender that has a far, far better capacity for focused attention than the other one. Women are far better at focused attention tasks than men in just about any category of focused attention as well. This is why, for example, uh, in Australia, the big open cast mines in Australia, in a huge, vast open cast mine in Australia, and all the drivers on those mines are women. Because women, one, are better at driving, and two, can actually pay attention for 10 hours in a row, and you need to pay attention when you're driving something that's nearly 100 tons. And, you know, women, if you want a good job, that pays really well. <laughs> You do have to exist in like 45 degree temperatures and probably be surrounded by a bunch of dicks, but yeah. six months. Um, in 2012, the journalist Sam Anderson called mobile games stupid games. Games for stupid people. You could go and read this article, it's really inflammatory, because when you unpick who he's talking about, it gets even more inflammatory. It's like, Blank spaces for distraction in everyday life. Nothing worthwhile whatsoever in playing a mobile game. And this even, you know, this academic research on this, so hardcore gamers apparently have better and different skills to the casual gamer. And, you know, there's academics who are out there saying, gaming is a skill, and these people have better skills than these people. The implication being that men are more skilled than women at this activity. That's kind of never really held true either. Um, but they are, these are the sort of stereotypical um, makeups that we have. Now, what I'm drilling into here is obviously, one, this is a cultural trope. I think, to be fair, this cultural idea does exist about different kinds of gamers. And two, the industry buys into this. 
This is this doesn't come out of nowhere. This is an industry-led sort of impression of things, and this leads to major problems with game with how gamers are even considered in society. As Jesper Jules says, that the whole thing is so oversimplified; it's beyond a joke. The context of play is always critical to understanding whether a game is casual or not. Me playing. Overwatch could just be as casual as somebody playing five minutes of Candy Crush on a bus. You know, because I'm not engaged in the manner that you'd be engaged in it. It would just be a casual thing for me. So it's actually the context in which we play which is important for whether something is serious or casual. You can be a hardcore mobile gamer. You know, there's people who play these things for years, are absolutely nuts on them, you know? And, I've got long, long histories of, you know, playing, playing for long sessions. Why is that any worse than me playing whatever I play for years? I don't actually have that relationship with any game anymore, but, you know, maybe when I was younger, I can pick out a few games which, you know... I don't, what I don't get about the distinction is one of the greatest time rots in history is... Um, these football manager games, championship manager and things like that. Oh my god. <laughs> Your face. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> um, Cheska, why you make that face? It's just all the same and it's just like, get alive. Oh, says the overwatcher. <laughs> At least I'm doing it, you know. Yeah, okay, I, I'll give you that. Uh, I, 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 no, um, Championship Manager is a colossal waste of time. Um, I refuse to go near it with a barge pole because I know that would be the end of me. I would be playing it all the time and I would be probably twitching it as well and I would be destroying portions of my house because I had a 3-2 defeat to Chesterfield or something like that, you know, it, it would get... I know my addiction points. Yeah. So, that game, you know, contextually, can you be a, a, you know, a casual gamer for that? Is there any way to engage with something like that, like that casually? Do you know anyone who plays it? You do. <laughs> What's your impression, Jordan? Um, so, our flatmate Matt from first year, he's like played it, I think, since first year, and yeah, he just plays it. Is he on the same game? Hmm? Is he on the same game? Um, I'm pretty sure. So we're talking two years of playing the same save state, basically. That's a, is that serious? <laughs> it's seriously something. <laughs> <laughs> Contextually, that's really, really, I think, not a casual experience. You know, people get into that. In, I know a lecturer who, you guys wouldn't know him because he's in politics, right? But, wow, the amount of hours he puts in. How he's not divorced is absolutely beyond me because I also know his wife and she's a, like, yeah, I wouldn't push it too much further, dude. Um, now, on the flip side, motion, mobile games can, can exist in the same way. Indeed, you can play Championship Manager on your phone, and a lot of people do. You know, it's, it's a mobile experience as well. In terms of thinking about mobile games, though, what we do very often is oversimplify the idea of what a mobile game is, and that makes it easier for us to consider them as casual experiences. Actually, mobile games are very, very complex systems with a complex inf um, interface to them, which actually, when we pick it apart, is really, really sophisticated. So a mobile game involves new kinds of literacy for us as players, in terms of understanding the interface itself, in terms of understanding, the, you know, in particular, the haptic interface of things, and being able to touch and use our hands in different ways. Require a lot of visual understanding and semantic understanding, so they train us in particular ways in terms of visual culture, change our bodily habits, change our memories of places. You know, our, our experience of place itself is transformed by playing uh, mobile games. And that mediated isolation 
you know, when do we actually play mobile games? Well, mostly in spaces where we want to create an, a bubble of isolation from others in that space. Trains, buses, waiting rooms, you know, um, these shared spaces where we don't necessarily want to be social within them. That creation of sort of isolation in those spaces is very, very sophisticated. You know, it means that we adopt particular bodily behaviours, we adopt particular social interaction behaviours with others, even if you think, I'm shutting it down, that's still a form of interaction with other people in order to indicate that you are not part of this space anymore. You are not an element of space for other people to engage with. And therefore become a very important part of the construction of culture itself. Mobile gaming is an incredibly important part of culture. You know, we engage in it in order to perform particular cultural roles in society. Therefore, it's, is it casual? I don't think so. It involves a hell of a lot going on that we're not willing perhaps to unpick. So Jasper Jules' point is, you call this casual, but there's far too much going on here for it to actually be casual. To switch a little bit in terms of how the industry thinks of these things, and to pick up um, industry toxicity, which we should be familiar with as a discussion. Game publishers perpetuate the dangerous cycle by repeatedly creating games for young men already entrenched in the existing culture of games. I don't think I could put it any better myself. This is what I mean by AAA games being marketed to particular people. Game companies and publishers make a set of games for a particular set of people which continually recycles particular cultural tropes. And the industry is therefore diminished by misogyny itself. We've got an industry which is risk averse, won't do new things, won't release things which are interesting and different. And we're going to get this, I don't know when, maybe next year, maybe the year after, with Grand Theft Auto 6. Right? There's going to be a female playable character in Grand Theft Auto. There has been female characters before, um, particularly in some of the mobile games that we brought out around the, the main cycle of games. <clears throat> Is this going to be groundbreaking? No, not in any way, shape or form. The, the female character is a cipher. The female character may as well be the male character, it may as well be X character. It's not, there's not going to be anything female about that character. It's about what we're asked to do as gamers when controlling that character, which is going to be interesting. It, you know, are we going to do women things? I don't want to sound awful by using that phrase, but you know, women and men do different things. Are, are we going to get an insight as male gamers into what it's like to be a woman? Or are we going to rob banks? You know, the, 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 the character's meaningless at that phrase. It, it's, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a visual construction. Unless you, unless they do something, they're not, but unless they do something really interesting with regards to embodying a female character in some way and rooting that in being a woman in everyday life, what the hell is the point? It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, it is going to be another example of what Anna Anthropy talks about here, games which perpetuate a particular cycle of activities are made for young men. That's what it's going to be. Um, because the risk aversion for AAA publishers makes female identities in games marginal, it makes other identities in games marginal, it perpetuates just a particular identity of things and marginalises everyone else. <clears throat> So, Sarah Chess argues that the game industry is the biggest revenue maker in the entertainment industry, and that's not even by a little, that's by a very, very long way, and is also the toxic cultural leader as well. Um, her um, key book on this is called Ready Play 2, and she makes one, which I think is a really, really important distinction. Player one who is ga our games designed for is male, white, affluent, able-bodied and heterosexual consumer of commercial AAA releases on console and computers. That is player one. That's the industry norm. That's who games are for. Player two, a woman that enjoys playing mobile games. The alternative to player one is player two. See, we, what we'll do as an industry is we'll focus most of our attention on player one because that's where the money is 
and we'll give the scraps to play it to. And fuck anyone who's not in this, because otherwise, the only way, like, you know, you can enjoy categories for player one is if you drop a lot of stuff about yourself as an individual and take on some of the tropes of being male, white, affluent, able-bodied, and heterosexual. Not to the extent that you become male, but that you have to adopt some of the cultural um, factors that are involved with this kind of identity. And this kind of thing, unsurprisingly, is very deeply related to Gamergate. Um, this is Brianna Wu. I recommend everyone should follow Brianna on Twitter. She's great. Um, Brianna Wu is a game designer. <laughs> this is her tweet from the middle of Gamergate, October the 14th, 2014. Talking about women in general in the games industry, we are not people to them, just objects to be hunted and bullied until we quit. As somebody who works within the games industry, she's not just talking about working in the industry itself, she's talking about her experience of being a gamer, engaging in games, engaging in game culture. And, you know, she was one of the main targets with Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian. Um, I don't. I put a little bit of the background to Game Again, how it started. Does any? I know you know about it, but does anyone else know a lot about what actually happened with Game Again? Okay. So, Zoe Quinn, a game designer. <sighs> you be careful what you say, but I don't actually think Zoe Quinn was that great as a game designer. The games are kind of bad. Bless. She's having a go, and there's some interesting topics in it, but they're not very good. <coughs> anyway, her ex-boyfriend alleged that Zoe Quinn was having a relationship with a games journalist, Nathan Grayson, um, who was then giving favourable reviews to her games on the basis of her relationship with him. Some, like Brianna Wu and Anita Sarkeesian, defended Zoe Quinn. They were targeted by a hashtag Gamergate, which led to the customary rape and death threats that always characterise going after women online. Um, this whole incident legitimises the culture of disrespect in gaming and in the industry itself. They're, now, even though it became a very famous thing and shone, shone a light on the toxicity of gaming culture in some regards, did anything purposeful or worthwhile come out of it in terms of women in games? No, not really. Still, to this day, <laughs> Brianna and Anita are targeted in a daily basis. And again, Anita Sarkeesian's um, YouTube channel is, is excellent. Her videos are really, really interesting. I think I've liberally sprayed some across this module in the extra material stuff. The comment section is an absolute set, even by YouTube standards, is bad. And, you know, YouTube is a cesspit to begin with. So, what am I getting at here? These people are not player one. Yeah? In terms of not just the game, gaming culture for the industry itself, but also gaming culture for those who are, see themselves as gamers, no voice, pipe down, shut up, stop it. You're not part of this. This is nothing to do with you. This is an exclusionary discourse. And as Humphrey says, the people outside the game or identity are marginalised, therefore, discursively, if not numerically. What she means by that is, there's millions and millions of women gamers. There's millions and millions of non-white gamers. There's millions and millions of poor gamers. There's millions and millions of, you know, not heterosexual gamers, whatever sexuality you want to call yourself. But they're not able to speak within the context of gaming culture. Gaming culture is this thing. And therefore the gamer is this thing. It's not you. It's me. It sucks to be you, John. Um... You know, it, it's, it's Josh, it's not Eve, yeah? And the culture itself, when something works discursively in this way, it stops you from being able to express yourself. There are barriers put up in order for things to be expressed. 
Now, some would argue, as Jeffrey Lynn does, right, um, he's got some balls. Arguing, <laughs> the League of Legends designer arguing the gamers aren't toxic. He's got some balls. But um, I kind of agree with the point. Gamers aren't innately toxic. You know, we as human beings don't, we're not born gamers one, and we're not born toxic individuals as well. We're made that way. <laughs> we, there is, you know, the, the context and the culture that we find ourselves creates toxicity. And as Lynn says, it's all about context. It's about the context inside the game and outside the game and how that can twist behaviour. Uh, and even in good people, you can create toxic, um, toxic behaviours. I do recommend you have a look at these websites. They are kept up to date. It will blow your mind. Um, the bigger gamer is, whoa, holy crap. Um, <laughs> fat, ugly or slutty is just beyond. It is horrendous. Um, I'm not sure if that one's still going, but I think they have a Twitter account. <laughs> um, and I think they have an Instagram account as well, which is well worth delving into. In terms, because, I mean, in this room, all right, we're surrounded by nice people, kind of. Not me so much, but you guys. I know at least Cheska has a, a huge amount of experience of this. Um, I'm sure some of you also have a huge amount of experience of this, but toxic gaming culture, although we can talk about it, a lot of people don't understand what it means, because it, it doesn't happen to me. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not targeted. It's not something which affects me in any way, really. I don't engage in it, I don't say that, but it's not a thing. Until you actually know it and have experienced it, it it's like talking in abstract. But Cheska, you can talk about it to great lengths, right? And, mm. you know, familiarity? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that resonance of like not being part of a community, I mean, that's the big thing, right? Yeah, no, because like, like the games that I play are team games. You need communication to win, you know? Mm -hmm. You need to talk and do call outs on mic. But um, it's like you don't have the same access because your viewer isn't as legit when literally you're just, you're the same rank as them, for God's sake. You're the same skill, but because you sound feminine. Yeah. It's stupid. It's, but it's true. Yeah. yeah sure. Right, let's stop there for five minutes and then um, we'll get into the deep stuff on it, on de-individuation. You could do this slide for me, <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs>